Good morning, everyone. Got a couple of announcements for you first on the Stacy Fetlin Pink Out Benefit and uh, Pink Out Night. Um, it has been moved. It's going to be now at the VFW on Tuesday night um, from 6.30 on July 29th. So take note of that. Also, <coughs> going on this morning down at the VFW, uh, we have the Five Island Yellow Bass Bash. They are a nonprofit organization. They bring awareness to the yellow bass population in Five Island. And the proceeds of the door go toward their winter tournament, fishing tournament that they have in January. Um, adults are seven dollars, and kids under five are free. That's all I got. Good morning and welcome to Church at Bethany this morning. Pastor Peter is in Montana with um, Sarah's family for the baptism of Jonathan Robert. And this morning we welcome Lynn Potter as our minister for today's service. So we'll go from there. Morning. Morning. Sorry, I guess there's a miscommunication as to who's doing what this morning, so I'm forgive me if I'm lost. Um, it looks like by the order of service, <coughs> the 126. We'll start with the service of the word. Page 56. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom our hearts are open, and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that in our bondage to sin, we cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will, and walk in your way to the glory of your holy name. Amen. O 
Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a call and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and by the power of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand for our opening a gathering hymn, O God of Mercy and Light. Creed, 
Let us affirm our beliefs today. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day He rose again and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray together. Almighty and merciful God, we implore you to hear the prayers of your people. Be our strong defense against all harm and danger that we may live and grow in faith and hope. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Do we have someone reading the scripture? Jesus as an example of selfless stewardship 
and reminds them that Christians have received abundantly so that they can share abundantly. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuine, genuineness of your love against the, eager, the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between our present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. Please rise for the hour when you or please rise for the gospel. <laughs> Message 
message that I am to uh, share and speak to persons of all ages and all walks of life. My name is uh, Lynn Potter and I'm a retired United Methodist pastor, so I want to thank you for accepting me uh, into your congregation, even though I'm a foreigner, <laughs> although we are all Protestants and all part of the body of Christ. Actually, I come from a long line of ministers, both my grandfathers and my dad, my sister and brother-in-law, and actually I was born here in Emmitsburg at the time when my dad was a pastor at Ruthven Methodist. And then later, in a couple years, we moved to West Union, as Methodist preachers are known to move, uh, Lakeview at a later time, and then Alden, Iowa. My first church was in Waterloo after I came out of seminary, and then I later served uh, four churches in a parish in Mount Air in uh, southern Iowa, and then Bettendorf, Lamars, and Esterville. I have titled the uh, message today as it comes out of this original sermon by Jesus on the mountainside, Spiritual Lessons from Nature. Now to be honest and realistic, we can see that not all of nature is always friendly or beautiful. There are so many uh, natural disasters that can be really terrible and take a toll on our human population. To some degree, such climactic occurrences can be placed at the door doorstep of our human fault, consequences of sin, our lack of care for God's creation, our pollution of the earth and the sky and the sea, our greed, our manufacturing uh, carelessness sometimes. These uh, actions or lack of action can wreak havoc upon our fragile home, the earth. Having said that, I recognize that not, not all of nature's storms can be blamed upon humans. I have to admit that I don't understand all of God's creation what the reason is for storms or tornadoes or volcanoes or tsunamis. And probably when I come before my maker, I might have a list of some questions like that for him as to why uh, good things happen or why bad things happen to good people and why even good people suffer from natural disasters and tragedies. What I do know from the gospel and from my life experience is that no matter what tragedy comes upon us, that God is with us to heal and to help to make uh, sweet cream out of sour milk, so to speak. But the main uh, focus that I'd like to place upon before our eyes today is the, the positive lessons, the positive things that come through nature and the outdoor world uh, to us and about God. I'm grateful that I grew up in rural Iowa, small towns, close to nature, whether it be the rivers or the woods or the lakes. Uh, my junior high days, we lived at all, we lived at Lake View, and so Blackhawk Lake was where I learned to fish and swim. Another nearby lake was Arrowhead. My friends and I used to like to go out and explore, pretend that we were explorers, naming the locations like uh, Fallen Rock or Standing Oak, or some really creative names like that. And then in high school, my family lived at Alden, where the Iowa River flows through town. And in fact, there's a little sign on the outside of town that says it's the best little town by a damn sight. <laughs> I didn't mean to swear this morning. At that time, I was seriously thinking about going into conservation or wildlife management or forestry, but by the time I got into college, uh, God was leading me into uh, ministry. Now, many years later, in a short, short enough span of life as I am retired, my wife Sally and I are blessed to live at Boss Island Lake. 
as you are blessed here in the Five Island. So many area lakes as well, and wetlands, and uh, beauty spots in nature. Other adventures I was privileged to enjoy uh, back in college and seminary was working in national parks. I was uh, blessed to work six summers in four different national parks. Yellowstone, the Grand Tetons, uh, Glacier, and then Shenandoah out east. Most of these summers I was in a program called the Christian Ministry in the National Parks, where I had a secular job like a bellhop or a busboy, and then I would volunteer on the weekends to lead worship in the hotel lobbies or out in the campground uh, amphitheaters. It is no coincidence that Jesus' most known sermon was in an outdoor setting, the Sermon on the Mount. He used many of nature's images to teach about God and the parables and the wisdom of God's kingdom. At one point in the sermon, he taught his followers to be gentle as doves and wise as serpents in Matthew 10. This time of year, Summer is a season that we especially enjoy the beauty of nature. A blazing campfire can be one example. Actually, wind and fire are elements that speak to us of our faith and the Holy Spirit. Wind and fire out of control can create a crisis, of course, where we have to call 911 or need help. But we need the tamer wind to breathe, the air that gives us life. Likewise, we need the controlled flames of fire to cook our food and to keep us warm in the wintertime. Another basic element of nature is water. Water makes up 71% uh, of the earth and its surface. 60% of our human body is H2O. So as you know, water is needed for life. and A human can go without food for several weeks, but only can live with Without water for three or four days. Water can symbolize baptism and remind us of that important sacrament. Through baptism we are reminded of God's grace-filled life and our response to faith. Looking back with gratitude on how God has led us to today and looking forward to what God's grace is leading us into the future. Speaking of water, let's explore a few other aspects of nature that can teach us about God and God living. Jesus, as we saw, pointed to the birds of the air. Notice how they trust in their Creator to provide. You who are warriors, let go and let God is the message. We have a wren that lives in our yard, serenades us every day with its beautiful sound. Birds can teach us about the simple joys of life and giving praise to God through song. Other birds can teach us, even the wild turkey, about being alert and perceptive. Turkeys are not wise in terms of human intelligence, but they certainly are wary and have gifted skills in sight and hearing. I know because I've tried to hunt turkeys and I know the slightest movement or sound can spook them. I call them the ghosts of the woods because even though they live there, you, you seldom see them because they know you're coming. Another bird, the raven, is a large black bird that is a member of the crow family that can teach us as well. In some parts of the Bible it is viewed positively, in other parts more unkindly. Its vulture-like appetite for decaying meat and its guttural cry of, ah, ah, ah. The raven can represent evil and death. I think of the writings of the naturalist Lauren Isley, who one day was leaning against the stump out in the woods, and he fell asleep. And this is what he wrote. When I awoke, dimly aware of some commotion and outcry in the clearing, the light was slanting down 
to the pines in such a way that the glade was like a vast cathedral. And there on an extended branch sat a raven, enormous raven with a red and squirming nestling in its beak. The sound that awoke me were the outraged cries of the parents of the bird. They, the parents flew helplessly in circles. The sleek black monster was indifferent to them. He gulped and wetted his beak on the dead branch a moment and sat still. Up to that point in the little tragedy, it followed the usual pattern. But suddenly, out of that area of the woodland, a soft sound of complaint arose. And into the glade, there were fluttering small birds of all half a dozen variety, drawn by the anguished cries of the tiny parents. No one, of course, dared to attack the raven, but they cried there in their common misery. The bereaved and the unbereaved, and the glade filled with their soft rustling and cry. They fluttered as though to point their wings at the murderer. There was a dim, intangible ethic that had been violated, and they knew that, for he was a bird of death. He, the murderer, the black bird at the heart of life, sat there, listening in the common light, formidable, unmoving, and untouchable. And then the sign died, and then I saw the judgment. It was a judgment of life against death, and I will never see it again so forcefully presented. For in the midst of the protest, they forgot the violence. There, in that clearing, the crystal note of a song sparrow lifted hesitantly in the hush. And finally, after painful fluttering, another took song, and then another, the song passing from bird to another, doubtfully at first as though some evil thing were being forgotten. And suddenly they took heart, and they sang from many throats joyously together, as birds are known to sing. They sang because life is sweet, and the sunlight is beautiful. They sang under the brooding shadow of the raven. In simple truth, they had forgotten the raven. They were the singers of life and not of death. End of quote. So may we in our faith as members of the Church of Christ be singers of life and not of death in what we say and what we do. Another bird that we can learn from is the common goose. They find a lot of strength and protection in the flocks and likewise as Christians in fellowship and community that we especially cherish now that we've passed through that terrible year of COVID. But our spiritual journey is not, is not a solo flight. And perhaps the V formation of geese flying can symbolize victory. Furthermore, geese and other birds and animals can teach us about parenting. Because in many species, the male and the female together raise the young. I've noticed that with geese, how protective they can be of their goslings. You try and get close to them and you probably evoke an attack even though you may be 200 pounds and they're only 20. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus not only spoke of the birds of the air, he also referred to the flowers of the field. And this time of the year, where we live, the wildflowers are so beautiful. And abundant. And this again speaks to us of God's utter joy in creation. Someone once said that God laughs in flowers. A flower can even teach us of the importance of forgiveness. Whether it's God's forgiveness of us or our forgiveness of ourselves or our forgiveness of others. One of my favorite quotes is by Mark Twain when he said that forgiveness is a fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that crushed it. Forgiveness is a fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that crushed it. Or consider the lowly dandelion, much hated weed by so many. Its leaves can make a salad, its stem can create a wine in the hands of a child, it can be a bouquet presented in love uh, to a mother or father. And as you know, the dandelion is an expert on spreading as the wind blows its tiny parachute seeds. A great lesson in evangelism, a mission for us as a church. 
in our outreach to a needy world. Rabbits are another uh, symbol, like a multiplication. God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply in Genesis. And this message can be interpreted simply as procreation or populating the earth, but it can also refer to the spreading of the good will and love and grace of God to the ends of the earth through us, our, his humble servants. Even a turtle can teach us, as the old saying goes, you don't get anywhere unless you stick your neck out. This introduces a quality of risk, and that's not only a quality in terms of the risk, whether you go gambling in a casino or whether it's a risk of love. Whenever we become loving, we risk rejection, we re risk being hurt. But if we do not love, then we are not being true children of God. We have to become vulnerable to love and be loved. And that living in a fortress is not the quality of life God intended. Back to the turtle example, on the surface, you know, they can be very plain and bland looking. In fact, I have to be careful when I drive around our area of Lost Island because there's so many turtles crossing the road and not to run over them. But if you stop and really look at a turtle, oftentimes you'll find on the other side a, a beautiful artwork of God in different colors. It's a good lesson for us not to judge others by the surface or even to judge ourselves but to look deeper, to look beneath, to see the essential beauty that God has placed within and as part of each of us as his creature. Even if we look at the trees, we can find lessons that are spiritual. We appreciate trees not only because of their beauty, but providing oxygen, cool shade, and of course fruit for our consumption. Joyce Kilmer said it best in his famous poem, I think I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree, a tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing breast, a tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray, a tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair, upon whose bosom snow has lain and intimately lives with rain, Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. Sermons can be found in stone. If you think about the amazing rocks and people that collect rocks and all their different varieties and beauty. Human beings have made works of art out of rocky mountainside like Mount Rushmore or the Badlands of South Dakota. How picturesque they can be. So maybe we should call them good lands. When I was little, our family vacations took us sometimes to Lake Michigan, and my sisters and parents and I would collect agates around the shoreline, and we'd bring them home, and my dad had one of those uh, rock tumblers. We'd put those uh, ugly-looking stones for a few days, and they'd come out so beautiful. So you know, even though the hard, even through the hard knocks of life, you and I can be, through the grace of God, resplendent, shining with the glowing splendor of God's beauty. A key part of our outdoor world is the sun, the S-U-N, without which, of course, we could not live. The same could be said of the sun, S-O-N, Jesus, the Son of God, that through him, as our Redeemer and Savior, we cannot really fully live without him. In John 11, 25, after the raising of Lazarus, Jesus told Martha, I am the resurrection and the life, and those who believe in me, those who believe in me will have life even if they die. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Wow, what a powerful message that is, not only for Easter, but every Sunday or every day. And if we really comprehend the power of that statement, and believe it, it can really blow our mind and transform our lives. Which takes us again back to the natural world, the solar sun, how mammoth it is. Three million miles in circumference. You can line up 109 Earths across the face of the sun. Or if you think of another miracle, 
grow smaller, like the firefly, the lightning bug, which is a reminder, or can be a reminder, of Jesus, the light of the world. Jesus calls us to be the light of the world, too, in his vital mission. In Matthew 5, he said, you are the light of the world, so live that people can see the good things that you do, and praise, not you, but praise your Father in heaven. Jesus has been described in so many different ways, even as a lion and the king of the beasts. In uh, C.S. Lewis, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, the lion figure re can represent Christ, Aslan, the lion. Some of God's creatures can teach us about the transformation of faith. Even the, the lowly frog. Isn't it uncanny, the process of metamorphosis? We start with a tiny frog egg that develops in a few days into tadpoles, and that develops then into a frog, which means every organ is transformed into something changing from living underwater to living more on land. The tail becomes the legs, the gills become the lungs, the teeth disappear, and our tongue develops. It changes from a vegetarian diet to a meat diet of insects. Butterflies are another example of transformation. An egg becomes a caterpillar, which is kind of like a worm, and then it attaches to a twig and sheds its skin and becomes the chrysalis. And the dramatic changes occur as this creepy, crawly insect in the shell hatches out to the beautiful, beautiful butterfly. So if God can accomplish these incredible things in the frog or in the butterfly, how much more he can do by working his magic in us if we allow it. And sometimes we need radical changes in our lives because we really can make a mess of our lives and we require major surgery by Dr. Christ. Finally, I will lift up the eagle as a wonderful example of a bird that teaches us of creation. So many Christian scriptures and psalms have been written about the eagle, this magnificent bird, and we have chosen it as our national bird. I'm so glad of all birds are selected for that. But seriously, the eagle is mentioned 38 times in the Bible, and we can learn so many lessons from it. As they mate for life, as the little babies are born, both the parents, both parents assume responsibility. The mother eagle is tough and tender. She sometimes can push the little ones out of the nest to teach them to fly, and then catch them with her wings before they hit the ground. That process is repeated until they do learn to fly. So that song, On Eagle's Wings, it is a favorite, compares God's care to the eagle. Sometimes God stirs us up out of our own comfortable nest, not to harm us, but to help us, and to help us mature into becoming a graceful creature that we are meant to be. Sometimes we try to be independent, we try to flap our wings to fly on our own. But when we trust God and allow his uplifting wing and wind to carry us, we then become like the eagle, soaring free. It's a blessing to see more and more of these eagles in our own area. Which brings me to the tail end of today's message, which to remind us that there are many more lessons that I don't have time to go into today some that you have discovered. And this next week, I would challenge you to think about that and watch for ways in which God can teach you not only indoors, but outdoors. And I hope these uh, reflections can be an inspiration to help you do that on your journey of faith. Amen. Do we have a song of the day? Let's take time to share the peace as we greet one another in the name of Christ.
Peace be with you. So I understand the offer plates are available for your gifts, and let us offer the prayer to dedicate those gifts from the bulletin. Merciful God and Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving that you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us come before our Trinitarian Triune God in prayer. And when I say, Lord, in your mercy, your response is hear our prayer. God of hope, the ministry of your church extends across all borders, from nearby neighbors to far and distant countries. Accompany all those who labor eagerly in service of the gospel, that through your good news all might experience transformation. We pray for our missionary, Courtney Davis, our companion Sinems, the Southern Diocese of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Tanzania and Okabaki, the parish companion with Lost Island and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in La Paz Parish in Chile, companion with Bethany. Lord, in your mercy, then. Amen. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the air we breathe, the water we drink, the land that provides food. Guard all species of plants and animals from harsh changes in climate. Empower us to protect all that you have made. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Righteous God, we pray for nations and leaders. Give them a spirit of compassion and steer them toward a fair distribution of resources, that none among us would have too much or too little. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. God of healing, your touch has the power to make us whole. We pray for those suffering from physical or mental illnesses and embrace those who are sick. Especially we're mindful and lift up Carol and Carolyn, and Bridget, Bill, Sarah and new baby David, Don and Roger, Robert, Robert Jr., Linda, Phyllis and Janice, Teresa, Darwin, Connie, Lucille, those we name in our hearts, and especially today we're mindful of the tragedy of the condominium collapse in Florida, that all the uh, victims and families that are in uh, unknown periods of waiting, the rescue workers and everybody affected, surround all of these people and all of these causes with your unwavering presence. Lord, in mercy. Amen. We pray for this assembly, all those gathered in worship. Revive our spirits and renew our relationships. Rekindle our faith that we might experience resurrection in this community. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And finally, we give thanks for the faithful ancestors in every age whose lives have pointed us toward you. Envelop them in your love that we may be reunited with one another in the last days. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We lift our prayers to you, O God, this Sabbath day, trusting in your mighty grace and power. Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the divine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of God.
So may the Lord bless and keep us, and the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious. The Lord look upon us with his favor and give us his peace. Amen. Our culminating hymn then is Over a Thousand Tongues to Sing. And I had to point out at uh, Lost Island Church too that this originally was written by Charles Wesley, one of the co-founders of the Methodist Church. Please stand. Thank you. 